Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, your host here on Last Week in the Church, the show where we harvest the fruits of the crop of the last week on the Vatican and Global Catholic Beat. Now, if you watch this show regularly, or really, if you've ever watched it at all, you know that normally we run through four or five basically unrelated stories. This week, however, is a bit of a special case because we're going to do a deep dive on just one story articulated in terms of seven different elements. That one story is all about a book this week. Actually, today, this very day, is the on-sale date of a new autobiography by Pope Francis, written in collaboration with an Italian journalist entitled Life, My Story Through History. In, this book is just chock full of interesting nuggets regarding the mind and the modus operandi of this maverick pontiff. We're going to look at seven specific elements. First, what he says about resignation. Second, what he says about his predecessor, Pope Benedict XVI. Third, his take on his critics. Fourth, what he says about future conclaves. Then, the furor over fiducia supplicans, the Pope's comments on abortion, and finally, what he says about the Vatican Girl case, that is the most celebrated unresolved mystery story in recent Vatican history, the 1983 disappearance of a 15-year-old girl who lived inside the Vatican walls. Then, at the bottom of the show, we will give a quick shout-out to a particular anniversary that is being marked in Italy today, widely unknown anywhere else, but I'm going to explain why it deserves to be on your radar screen. All that and more is waiting for you on this week's edition of Last Week in the Church, so please don't go anywhere. I will be right back. This is our official Last Week in the Church infomercial because I come to you with a special offer for all of those would-be Catholic eggheads out there. That is, if you're the kind of person who likes sounding smart, who likes creating the impression that you know things other people don't, that certainly describes me. If that describes you, you're going to want to know about this. Now, I've already spoken about this new app, this new online resource called Magisterium AI. Basically, what it allows you to do is to type in a question like, what does it mean that the Pope is infallible? Or what does the Catholic Church teach about the environment? Or, you know, whatever. And it will give you a short, smart, easily digestible answer based on more than 5,000 official magisterial texts. But recently, these guys have created a new feature on the app. It's called the Scholarly Mode which draws not just on official texts, but also the best and brightest of Catholic thinkers and theologians over the centuries, from Augustine and Aquinas to more contemporary figures. And we'll also give you a very quick answer about what those folks have had to say about what the church teaches on various issues. Now, I promise you that if you try this once, you're going to wonder how in God's name you ever lived without it. It's brought to you by our friends at Longbeard. They are the digital marketing design company that provide the IT backbone for Crux. They provide the same service for a slew of other Catholic organizations and outfits. They are they're brilliant, and they are creative, and they are tremendous. And I'm kind of out of adjectives at this point, which is saying something, because I traffic in adjectives. But I am telling you, these people are the absolute level best. So. Check it out. This is Magisterium AI, their new scholarly mode. You're going to dig it. Magisterium.com, that is Magisterium.com. It comes with my personal guarantee. Well, hello, everybody. Happy Tuesday to you. Happy Tuesday, March 19th, 2024. Today is, of course, the Feast of St. Joseph, which in Catholic terms basically makes it Father's Day. So a tip of the cap to all those dads out there. Hope you are having a fantastic day. Today is also a special anniversary in Italy for another reason, somewhat sadder. We're going to come to that at the bottom of the show. But, you know, here's another thing that makes today unique. Today is the official publication date of the Pope's new autobiography. This is a book entitled Life, My Story Through History. Officially, Pope Francis is, is listed as the author. 
although the actual sort of heavy lifting in terms of preparing the text was done by an Italian journalist by the name of Fabio Marchese Ragona. He works for Mediaset, which is one of the big media outlets here in Italy. Now, this book is basically a kind of traipsing through the light of Pope Francis. So it begins with his childhood in Argentina, his experience of the Second World War, his thoughts on the moon landing in 1969, but it then comes fairly quickly into his ecclesiastical career, his experience of the resignation of Pope Benedict XVI, and of course various aspects of his papacy, including his potential future post-papacy. All of this makes the book a absolutely fascinating and invaluable read. We're going to do a deep dive here today on seven different elements that I think are interesting and that help us understand the mind and the way of doing business of Pope Francis. So let's begin with what the pontiff has to say about resignation. Largely, he repeats things he has said in other interviews and other venues recently in which he says that he is not currently contemplating resigning the papacy, that he never has up to this point seriously considered resigning the papacy, and that in general he thinks resignation is, you know, one of those break glass in case of emergency options. That is, it should not be a routine way of doing business. It should not become normal. It should happen only in the case of a devastating, crippling, incapacitating medical emergency. He says ordinarily he believes the ministry of the Pope ought to be ad vitam, that is for life, so you reign until you die. However, he did say that he has left a letter with the Vatican Secretary of State, as he notes other popes have done, saying that if he is medically incapacitated and completely unable to govern, then this letter can be invoked to trigger his resignation. Now, he did, however, sort of play out the what-if scenario a little bit. He said that in the event that he were to resign the papacy, he would not quite do it the way Benedict XVI did. That is, he said he would not be called Pope Emeritus, but rather he would be called Bishop Emeritus of Rome, and he would not live in the Vatican, but instead he would move to the Basilica of St. Mary Major in Rome, where he said he would hear confessions and administer communion to the sick. Footnote, this show is filmed in a studio at the Pontifical Oriental Institute, which is right across the street from St. Mary Major. So in the unlikely event that this situation plays itself out, and we do have a Bishop Emeritus of Rome one day, Perhaps he would agree in his graciousness to cross the street and sit down here in studio and have a quick chat. Just a thought. In all honesty, this is unlikely because the truth of it is, if Francis is only going to resign if he is completely medically incapacitated, then that raises questions whether he would even be able to hear confessions or administer communion to anyone else. I mean, in other words, this is probably a long shot scenario. But in any event, that's what he said. And it is interesting to contrast this recent line of Pope Francis, that is, no, I'm not going to resign, don't think resignation is a good idea, no plans to do it. And I should add, he also said that he has lots of stuff he still wants to do. He wants to finish the Synod of Bishops on Synodality. He looked forward to the, the Great Jubilee next year, which he said should produce a great surge in faith, and on and on. Contrast that to what he said early on in his papacy. You remember early on, he talked about how he might have a brief papacy, maybe two, three, four years. He said in an interview with Mexican television in 2014 that he thought Benedict XVI's resignation should not be an exception, that it should become an institution, suggesting that popes could just normally resign as a matter of course, and, and created the impression that that was something he was taking very seriously. The question is, what has changed? in the last 11 years to move Pope Francis from thinking papal resignation was a good idea that could become quasi-institutional and normal to something that should be exceptional and invoked only in case of grave emergency. Well, I think that brings us to point two, what Pope Francis had to say in this new book about his predecessor, Benedict XVI. On a personal level, Francis is full of praise and warmth 
for Benedict. He talks about the great admiration he had for the courage Benedict showed in resigning. He quotes writings, both of Pope Benedict. He quotes Caritas and Veritate, also the speech Pope Benedict gave in Brazil in 2007, opening the Aparecida Conference of the Latin American Conference of Bishops, over which then Cardinal Jorge Mario Bergoglio presided. And he also quotes some radio addresses that a young Joseph Ratzinger, Father Joseph Ratzinger, the future Pope Benedict, had given just after the Second Vatican Council. So on a personal level, it is a deeply affectionate and respectful treatment. On the other hand, Pope Francis does say in a couple of different places that he was unhappy with the dynamics of having Benedict, the way that having Benedict around as a retired pope played out. At one point, Pope Francis said that unscrupulous individuals attempted to manipulate Pope Benedict for political and ideological reasons, thereby dampening, deepening rather, divisions in the church. And at another point, shortly after that, Francis said that his, his initial thought when he went out to see Benedict immediately after his election in 2013 is that he wanted to encourage Benedict to be active in the life of the church. You'll remember that when Benedict announced his resignation, he said, from here on out, I will be hidden from the world. Well, Francis says when he went out to see Benedict at Castel Gandolfo, right after he was elected as Benedict's successor, he told Benedict that instead of that, he wanted Benedict to be visible, to play a role in the life of the church, presumably to avoid stoking speculation that he had placed Benedict under some kind of gag order or that Benedict was secretly working against him behind the scenes. The idea was that if he was seen out in public at the new Pope's side, it would promote an image of kind of common cause, right? Continuity, solidarity. But Francis says, unfortunately, that didn't work. And that, in fact, over the 10 years that Benedict continued as emeritus Pope, said there were no shortage of problems that did damage to both sides. The Pope doesn't quite say, what he believes both sides to be, but I presume the reference there would be to supporters of Benedict and supporters of the new Pope Francis. He doesn't specify what those problems are, but of course we all know what they were. I mean, the the most famous case probably was in the aftermath of the Synod for the Amazon when there was speculation that Francis might be considering approving married priests Benedict became involved in the publication of a book arguing in favor of priestly celibacy. He later insisted he had not been the co-author of that book, but it was all a mess, and it created the impression, kind of rival camps between the Benedict camp and the Francis camp. In other words, I would connect the dots between what Francis has to say about resignation and what Francis had to say about the experience of the retired Pope Benedict to conclude that he basically did not like the way in which Benedict became a point of reference for critics of his papacy, probably does not want to see that for future popes, perhaps has drawn the conclusion that such division would be inevitable, and therefore that resignation should not become the norm. It should remain a rare exception only in the case of grave medical necessity. All right, that brings us to point three on the countdown, what the pope had to say about his critics. Now, in general, Francis said, He doesn't really pay attention to everything that is said and written about him. He quipped that were he to do so, first of all, he wouldn't do anything else. And secondly, he would need a weekly appointment with a psychologist. However, he did add that he is aware that there are some who believe that he is destroying the papacy. That's the phrase that was used. He said he had read that someone had said that Francis is destroying the papacy. And and obviously the tone, of what he said was that he was hurt by that remark. What I think is interesting, however, is the reason he gives for which this unnamed source said he's destroying the papacy. It is because, Francis said, that he has reduced the distance between the pope and the people. That is, he has come close to the people. Now, the thing of it is, if you actually look at what critics of this papacy say, That, to be honest, is a bit of a straw man. I mean, I don't know, well, I shouldn't say I don't know anybody. I mean, there are some people who have complained that Francis has compromised the majesty and the awesomeness of the papacy with his kind of everyman style. 
But in general, most people actually think that the way Francis, his pastoral gift for being close to people, especially the suffering and those who have been victimized and forgotten, most people, I think, think that's one of the real virtues, one of the real strengths of this papacy. If you look at what most critics of this papacy say, it's not that he's excessively close to people. It's instead they charge that he is promoting doctrinal confusion, for instance, with his approach to communion for divorced and civilly remarried Catholics or his approach to blessings for same-sex unions. Others complain that he has an autocratic and idiosyncratic, <laughs> that is overly personalistic, style of governance. That is, that he imposes his own will, riding roughshod over systems, structures, and laws. I mean, just this past week, two different experts in church law brought out essays, very lengthy essays, in one case 180 pages, analyzing the Vatican's recent trial of the century, both of them concluding that Pope Francis essentially laid waste to the due process rights of the defendants in these prosecutions by interfering in the judicial process at several key stages. I mean, now these are debatable propositions, right? The idea that the Pope is sowing confusion or that he's an autocrat. I mean, you know, that's hardly objective truth. But those are the real charges that critics are making. Really has relatively little to do with how close he comes to people. And the fact that the Pope would frame his criticism that way would suggest that he is not yet at the point, probably, of entering into, what, a serious rethink of the way he does business, that is, of taking this criticism on board, because if you were going to do that, I suppose the first step is you would at least acknowledge what the actual content of the criticism is. All right, fourth, the Pope also says something interesting about future conclaves. He notes that, and he's right about this, he said that not long ago, some American media outlets, and he doesn't name them, but we're talking about the pillar and the remnant, contained news stories regarding possible revisions to the rules for future conclaves, that is, future papal elections. The pillar had reported that the Pope was considering two changes to the general congregations, that is, the meetings of cardinals that precede the actual conclave. And those changes would be, number one, potentially excluding cardinals over the age of 80, who therefore are ineligible to take part in the conclave itself. And number two, rather than having cardinals give speeches to one another, it would be more like the recent Synod of Bishops on Synodality, where in small groups they would meet around tables and have conversations. Now, the remnant report added to that that the Pope had also considered or was considering more sweeping changes that would inject not merely cardinals, but also religious and laity, including lay women, into the conclave itself. In other words, that religious and laity, including women, would actually have a vote for the next Pope. In both cases, these reports suggested that the Pope had tasked Italian Cardinal. Girlanda, Gianfranco Girlanda, a canon law expert, was preparing a draft of new rules for the conclave. Girlanda promptly denied this. He's denied it on multiple occasions, said, if there is some new thing on the conclave being prepared, I have nothing to do with it. And in this book, the Pope calls this pure fantasy that was invented for the purpose of damaging and dividing the church. Now, he was referring there specifically to the idea of including laity, including women, and religious as voting members of the conclave. He didn't address the idea of changes to the general congregation, so we don't know where that stands. But in any event, clear suggestion is he is not, at the moment, considering tinkering with the conclave. By the way, let me just add that were the pope to make changes to the process, this would hardly be unprecedented. Every modern pope, Paul VI, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, all in one way or another tweaked the conclave rules. So should Francis choose to do that, it would hardly be a dramatic departure from tradition, but at least to judge from, from the new autobiography, it's not presently on the docket. All right, that brings us to fiducia supplicans of the Vatican's uber, hyper, or controversial document on the blessing of what they euphemistically call irregular unions, most controversially, of course, 
including same-sex unions. The Pope addresses this controversy in the autobiography. And the way he does so is interesting. I mean, on the one hand, he sort of doubles down on the spirit of the document. He says, it is important to reach out to this constituency that is the LGBTQ plus community that historically has been marginalized and bullied and made to feel like second-class citizens. He insists that Jesus spent a lot of his time with the marginalized and that it is the responsibility of the church to open its arms and to embrace everyone. So in that sense, he clearly is defending kind of the impetus, the spirit of the document. On the other hand, he also says that if some bishops decide not to follow the path, that Fiducia Supplicans sets out. And of course, we know that some bishops already have said publicly they are not going to follow this path. They're not going to permit these blessings of same-sex couples, including, in a united fashion, all the bishops of the continent of Africa. Pope Francis says this diversity in approach is not the antechamber to schism because, as he points out, there has been no change to doctrine. He insists that the church's doctrine on marriage, what constitutes a marriage, that is, a union between a man and a woman that is permanent and open to new life, that that, docu- that doctrine has not changed, will not change. He indicates the church has no power, suggesting he personally has no power to change the nature of the sacraments. Now, he tacks on to that, that he remains a supporter of civil unions, that is, the ability for same-sex couples to have their rights recognized under civil law, but he says in terms of the sacrament of marriage, that's a no-fly zone. And, you know, further indicates that he is at peace with the idea that he has created a possibility here that a fairly substantial chunk of the church may choose not to exercise. So, you know, it's interesting that you have a situation where the Pope, on the one hand, is very much defending the aim of this new possibility he's created, but clearly is unwilling to translate this possibility into a mandate. And it will be very interesting. to He also notes that this will continue to be discussed at the Senate of Bishops on Synodality this October. It will be very interesting to track the conversation among participants in the Synod when they gather here in Rome in the fall. All right, next point on our rundown is what the Pope had to say about abortion. When it comes to the subject of abortion, Pope Francis notes that he has been decrying and lamenting the scourge of abortion since 1969, the year of the moon landing. He goes on record once again as calling abortion murder and a grave crime. He says those complicit in abortion are tantamount to mercenaries and to hitmen. That, of course, is an image he's used before. And he says it is critically important to protect the rights of conscience so that where abortion is legalized, medical personnel and others ought to have the right to opt out on the basis of conscientious objection. He further says it is very important to support women, I presume he means particularly in this case pregnant women, so that they don't feel that they have no choice other than to have an abortion. Now, you know, this is in one way kind of the standard rhetoric you would expect any pope to roll out on abortion, but this is a case in which Pope Francis is to some extent a victim of his narrative, right? The narrative, the media narrative about Pope Francis is that he's a liberal. And the way narratives work in the media business, every public figure has a narrative. And when a public figure does something that is consistent with their narrative, we cover it because it's what we expect. It makes sense to us. When a public figure does something that contradicts their narrative, we tend to shy away from it because we don't understand it and we feel like it would require too much explanation, right? So when Pope Francis talks about migrants, when he talks about climate change, when he talks about gays and lesbians, when he talks about mercy and tolerance and he rails against clericalism, that gets a lot of coverage because it's consistent with the narrative, okay? We feel we're on safe ground. However, his language on abortion, because it seems, at least to some, more conservative 
doesn't necessarily compute with a narrative, and so it doesn't get the same kind of coverage. Now look, there is a legitimate argument to be had about whether Pope Francis has compromised the Vatican or the church's pro-life witness during his 11 years in power. There are some, for instance, who would argue that he has reoriented the Academy for Life, for instance, the Pontifical Academy for Life, from being primarily a beachhead for the pro-life movement to having a much vaguer and broader mandate and on and on. But in terms of his personal position on this issue, there simply is no serious question that this is a robustly pro-life pontiff. I mean, a guy who is going to compare someone who has an abortion to a hitman, I don't really think you can argue that he is a stooge for the pro-choice position. In other words, a classic case in which a media narrative sometimes obscures our perceptions. Finally, just very briefly, I will note that for Italians in particular, it was very interesting to note that also in the new autobiography, the Pope made reference to the infamous Vatican Girl case. This is the 1983 disappearance of a 15-year-old girl by the name of Emanuela Orlandi, whose father was a minor official in the prefecture of the papal household, and whose family lived in an apartment on Vatican grounds kind of right next to the Swiss Guard barracks. This, her disappearance, which more than 40 years later remains unresolved and unexplained, has become the kind of Italian version of the Kennedy assassination. It is the mother of all mysteries and the font of all kinds of conspiracy theories and speculation over the years. In the new book, Pope Francis notes that the Vatican still suffers from the disappearance of Emanuela Orlandi, that he continues to pray for her and her family, especially her mother. It notes that the Vatican has recently opened a new investigation to try to bring the truth to light and says he wants to be close not just to the Orlandis, but to every family that has lost a loved one. This is of particular interest here in Italy because an Italian parliamentary probe into the Orlandi case just opened this past week with the election of leadership. It's a 40-member commission composed of members of the Italian Senate and the Italian Chamber of Deputies. It has a mandate for at least the next couple of years. We'll be conducting, a, it has subpoena power. We'll be conducting high-profile hearings. We will obviously be tracking how all this plays out. So the Pope's comments were interpreted not merely as a plug for the Vatican investigation, but also in a sense for this parliamentary inquest. Finally, before we wrap up this week, I just want to note that today is not merely the feast of St. Joseph, but it's the feast, it's a remembrance of another guy whose name was Joseph, Giuseppe. Father Giuseppe Diana, known as Don Pepe, which is how Italians often abbreviate this nickname for Giuseppe. He was an anti-mafia priest in southern Italy. He lived in a place called Casal del Principe, which is about an hour south of where I am sitting right now as I speak to you. He was well known for challenging the hold of the Comora, that's the version of the mafia that reigns supreme in that part of southern Italy. Challenging, basically trying to give youth alternatives and trying to break the hold of the Camorra on civic life in the place where he lived. He wrote a famous document publicly denouncing the Camorra and calling on the church to be tougher in the way it interacted with the mob. The title of that document was Per Amore del Mio Popolo Non Tacero. For love of my people, I will not keep quiet. That went off like a bombshell. And for his trouble, in the company of other famous Italian anti-mafia priests, on March 19, 1994, 30 years ago today, he was gunned down by an assassin of the Camorra, shot four times in the sacristy as he was preparing to celebrate the early morning mass on what the Italians call his onomastico, that is, his saint's name day. He has not officially been declared a martyr. He has not officially been beatified or canonized. But for most Italians, particularly those whose lives have most been scarred by organized crime, he is one of the heroes of the Italian Catholic Church. And he is a reminder that martyrdom is not just a matter of the distant Catholic past, 
nor is it a phenomenon that occurs only in far off lands in the developing world. This happened in our time, roughly an hour from where I am sitting by car, and it keeps happening anytime a Catholic, cleric, or lay takes a stand for justice in the name of the gospel. So although I'm not officially licensed to say this, I'm going to do it anyway. Don Pepe Diana, ora pro nobis. Pray for us. That is our show for this week. You can find full coverage of all of these stories on the Crux site. That is cruxnow.com. We will be back here next week, same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week, and we will talk to you again very soon.